Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Frontline Club. Thank you for coming to tonight's discussion. Um, before I hand over to Azade Movini, who will be chairing this evening, if I can ask you to switch your phones to silent, and when it comes to questions, if you can wait for the microphone, because we are broadcasting live. Over to Azade. Well, <coughs> thank you all very much for coming. It's lovely always to be here um, and to be um, chairing such a fantastic panel. Um, I'm just going to say a very few brief words, and then I'm going to let each of our panelists introduce themselves and share with you just a few thoughts um, that they have on the upcoming election predictions and what they think is going to be interesting to look out for and watch. Um, I'm going to keep my comments very short. Um, I think that this election is happening for Iran at a very deep moment of crisis. The economy is arguably at its worst state since the end of the Iran-Iraq war back in 1988. Uh, inflation is, is um, as high as 40 percent, if not higher. Unemployment among young people, 27 percent. Um, Western financial sanctions have pretty much choked off the Iranian economy from much of the rest of the world. So it's a deep, deep moment of economic crisis and also unprecedented political deadlock within the system. Um, so we are approaching a very important vote with the region in upheaval, the economy in upheaval, and a lot of uncertainty. It's, it's quite unclear what this election is going to shape out to be like, whether there will be uh, significant participation, and what the key contenders are going to emerge, um, how that sort of jockeying is going to emerge in uh, relation to the political squabbling and the factional deadlock that we have. So it is an uncertain and precarious moment for Iran, and it will be, however, a very significant election. So I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to each of our panelists to introduce themselves and tell us um, about what they're looking at ahead. I'll start with uh, Mehri Honabi Holiday. Um, hi. Um, well, you, you were asked to say a few words about ourselves. Uh, so um, I'm um, a practicing artist, an academic, and uh, I write about um, social change in Iran, um, particularly um, gender, and um, by that I mean women as well as men. Um, so um, um, I look at uh, um, a young, the young generation, the post-revolutionary um, generation, um, and the way they conduct themselves in order to um, uh, determine, speculate, and determine the uh, civil society movement in Iran. And this um, incredible desire that Iranians have for a more um, developed um, democracy. So um, in order to um, um, create a, a cartography of what's happening in Iran, I go through the lived experience of the, the new generation, by which I mean the post-Iran-Iraq war, um, the uh, the Iraq Iran Iraq war finished in um, 1988. Um, I um, I'm a peace activist. I, I um, other than working in the studio, I am a peace activist. I am against uh, military attack and sanctions on Iran. I think these are um, in inevitably the suffocation of the Iranian nation, um, and. Um, I believe dialogue, political dialogue, and involving um, countries from the East, um, um, other than as well as China, India, and Russia, is really crucial. So that's a little bit about me, who I am. And I, for this uh, uh, gathering, I was uh, um, studying and talking to people who know about or who are um, um, interested in the elections in Iran. Um, well, as uh, it's been pointed out the the picture the economic picture is is um, incredibly dark um, and uh, uh, this uh, is interesting in that uh, the um, uh, syndicate of uh, of of um, the the free union free labor unions are threatening the government with extensive um, um, demonstrations and strikes um, and despite uh, many, many channels that are open to them to go and um, find out about n the minimum wage legally. So that's uh, um, one development. The um, um, merchants in dealing in steel in the bazaar are threatening the government at the moment uh, to protest. 
um, that this, uh, the teachers' union have been uh, off and on protesting him uh, and discussing further strikes in Iran. And so the government is really in, in, a, in a very difficult situation. And that's where there is just a possibility of getting a candidate who might be um, something like what the Iranian nation desire. Um, uh, 85, um, you, you're, we are aware of the Green Wave or Green Movement, whose leaders are now in confinement with their wives. Um, and uh, um, this is connected to civil society movement, so I am interested in that. And it is interesting that um, um, the government uh, is uh, um, um, refraining from abuse um, recently on, on websites about these people who are in jail, who are in, uh, under house arrest. And there has been a committee, a, re, a, a series of letters written to the um, president uh, um, of between 2000, um, uh, 1997 and 2005, Mohammad Khatami, to consider to become a candidate for presidency. <coughs> and, and this demonstrates that um, nobody is, in Iran is uh, um, trusted uh, by the nation. They want to go back, although Khatami was not their ideal, they say, but they want to work with him in order to have um, the confidence of the people within and people without. Thank you very much. I can turn it over to Kasra Naji. Um, yes. Um, my name is Kasra, Kasra Naji, and I'm a journalist with the BBC Persian service. I've been covering Iran on and off for about 30 years, as long as the Iranian revolution, really. I started my first job as a journalist soon after the revolution, and I'm still at it, um, 35 years, 34 years on. Um, I've written a book uh, a few years ago uh, about Ahmadinejad. Um, it's a biography of him a set against the past 30, 35 years. Um, it's relevant today, that book, in a sense that when I was researching that book, um, I had to go back and to, to see how um, Ahmadinejad got elected to begin with in 2005. And during that research, I came to um, quite a lot of material that um, was uh, that showed how um, difficult it was for the hardliners in Iran today, who are in power today in Iran, to be out of power during that um, eight years of President Khatami. President Khatami came to power uh, in a genuinely um, interesting and exciting election in uh, 1997, if I'm not uh, wrong, uh, he, uh, some 80% turnout in that election, 70% of them voted for him. And he was seen as a, a reformist candidate, a Gorbachev of Iran. And um, his election showed how things had changed in Iran in a sense that people had enough of the hardliners uh, policies in the past and they wanted to start anew uh, with a moderate government and um, away from fundamentalism if you like. It was for the hardliners who at that time lost the election. It was a humiliating defeat. They never forgot it. Um, they did everything in their power to stop Khatami in his tracks. Uh, during the eight years he was in power, uh, basically rendering him um, powerless uh, towards the end, completely powerless towards the end. Uh, and when I researched all that period, the conclusion was that these people were so humiliated that uh, they were sitting there watching power slipping from their hands and seeing the revolution wrested from them uh, and uh, the revolution that they had hijacked to begin with had been re-hijacked by the uh, liberals 
and, and the reformists, as they saw, uh, they saw it. And many of them promised never, ever again allow these people to come back to power. And in the next two elections, we had uh, President Ahmadinejad getting elected uh, with a lot of controversy, both in the first uh, election in 2005 and then in 2009 again. Um, my only conclusion, really, to begin with, to start this debate, I'm not going to go on too much, is that um, I think that there are these people who are very powerful today in Iran, and they are, they've come to the conclusion that to um, hold on to power, to hold on to power is a lot more important that, than the dictates of the ballot box. So if it comes to the point that they, they see um, this ballot box is not going to go their way, they're going to do everything in their power to, to make sure that the outcome is what they want to see. I leave it at that for the moment, and then we can discuss more later. Um, my name is um, Golnush Niknishad. I also go by Kelly. It's a um, long story. Um, I was, like Castro, I'm old enough to remember the revolution. I had lived in Iran and the United States before, during, and after the revolution. And by the time we left Iran in the mid-1980s, um, I didn't want to have anything to do with Iran. I started my professional career as a journal, as an attorney, and I became a journalist covering criminal courts. And after 9-11, as much as, as a cliche as it sounds, I became very interested in covering Iran. And um, <coughs> it, was very, it was very difficult for me to do because nobody wanted me to do it unless I went to Iran to do it. But with my experience with Iran, I thought there were a lot of advantages to not actually being based in Iran. As you know, like the BBC is not based in Iran, it's based in London. But um, I went to journalism school and started focusing on um, the Khatami presidency. And the research I was able to do in New York told me a lot more about what was going on in Iran. And there were so much more nuances and what I felt that I was able to dig up from far away than what was being reported in the New York Times for the entire Khatami presidency. You know, both. And when you start looking at the reasons why, um, I thought the election, the coverage was so weak, and um, you know it was pr pretty obvious. People playing politics, trying to get access, trying to maintain access, and um, having to censor yourself um, in order to be able to, you know, to give a, give a very lopsided picture of what's going on um, to make everyone happy. And um, because it's the New York Times, everybody um, emulates whatever it says. Um, so. I decided um, after journalism school to start focusing on um, covering Iran from, you know, from far away. And I started um, after the presidential election in the United States. You know, when Obama became president, I decided that um, this was the time to do it. I didn't predict what was going to happen with you know, the election. Uh, four years ago, but I felt it was a very going to be a very important moment. And I felt like from everything that I've been able to gather, I was living in the Middle East for a year and talking to a lot of people who, um, you know, Iranian officials, a lot of people who were in Iran, who were, um, that Ahmadinejad wasn't as popular as he was made out to be. And so I was very curious to see how he was going to win a re-election. I wanted to make sure that we were set up to cover it as, um, well as possible, and when the election happened, my theories about why it was difficult to cover Iran from Iran came was put to the test, and we were one of the only places left actually reporting on Iran when everybody else got shut down. So, and now I'm, we're in part. We were, so we were at PBS at Frontline for four years, um, the Frontline in Boston, and now we're in partnership with the Guardian. Do you want to say anything about the elections and why sure. should um, we go straight into um, it? I think the conventional thinking on the election this time is that it's going to be a very highly you know, orchestrated event. Um, the candidates are going to be very, you know, they're going to be vetted by the Guardian Council. Very conservative, conservative candidates that are all loyal to the regime are going to compete. And someone who's very loyal to the Supreme Leader is going to come out of the ballot box 
and um, nothing, you know, they've had four years to make sure that what happened four years ago does not happen again. And um, so it won't be that interesting an election, at least the conventional thinking goes. And the next big jolt is going to be when um, the Supreme Leader passes away. So that's, um, but it's going to be important in terms of who the next president is going to be because he'll probably get reelected, which means at eight years where the chances of Khamenei passing away and having you know the power struggle, the vacuum that he's going to leave, and who's actually what's going to actually happen after that is very important. And whoever is president is going to have um, you know a big. They will have a role in who the next supreme leader or the supreme council, whatever replaces um, Khamenei is going to be. So that's the conventional thinking, and in terms of just an overall, I think there's three main factions right now that are considered important. One is Ahmadinejad, president, and his and Mashai, who people think are, who become the opposition. Um, it's one of the most interesting things I think that has happened over the past four years. Same people who you know, risk their lives, you know, going into the streets and. Um, protesting against Ahmadinejad are actually saying they want to vote for Masha if he were on the ballot. The chances of him being on the ballot um, are probably very slim and continue to get more slim as Ahmadinejad becomes more and more belligerent as the election gets closer. And there's um, all kinds of public squabbles going on between them. But that's just, I'll just to, um, just to get this discussion started. The other faction is the conservative faction that refers to itself as a two plus one. These are very conservative candidates that are very close to the supreme leader. It's Ali Akbar Balayati, who used to be the foreign minister during the 1980s and is a special advisor to him on foreign affairs. Um, um, Qadi Bof, who's a very popular mayor of Tehran, and there's Haddad Adad, who used to be the speaker um, of parliament and is related to the supreme leader by marriage. So one of these guys is going to emerge and the other two are going to go away. And then the third faction is led by um, Ms. Bayazdi, I think, um, I don't know if that name rings a bell, but just recently they um, put forth their candidate, which is um, Lan Karani, who was Ahmadinejad's health minister, and then he got fired. But um, that's also very interesting because that faction was very interested. They were, it was between Jalili, who was um, one of the negotiators, and him. Jalili is much closer to the Supreme Leader. They opted for someone who wasn't close to him, to Lan Karani. So Lan Karani is their candidate, and these are the three main factions. And of course, there's others that are, we can talk about. Thank you. Thank you. That's <clears throat> helpful to start out with a sort of lay of the land. Because um, I did want to start out talking about these factions. and what these kind of rivalries, these factional rivalries, and this power struggle tells us about the political landscape and the economic landscape. Because I think that increasingly, a lot of this political infighting goes back to economic interest. And it's not purely ideological anymore. It's political, economic, as well as, as ideology that's involved. Um, and for all of you who don't sort of follow this criminology very closely, it's become extremely colorful in Iran, this kind of political infighting. I mean, scenes in parliament over the last few months with the Speaker of, the Speaker of Parliament and Ahmadinejad having these sort of Don Corleone discussions about, you know, threatening to release, um, you know, evidence and videotapes and audio recordings of corruption and the Speaker of Parliament saying, you know, get out of parliament to the president. Uh, two, two days later or a few days later, the Speaker of Parliament goes to Qom, the holy city, um, and is pelted by shoes by Ahmadinejad supporters, uh, you know, slinks, slinks back to Tehran in, in humiliation. So it's become very, very colorful. Um, and it's not clear how much of this, uh, how much of these sort of rivalries will spill over to, into the election because it's not clear whether all of these camps and, and factions will be able to field their candidates. Ultimately, 
the Guardian Council, as, as Golnish said, will be vetting. So we don't know, but I'd like to um, sort of briefly have some thoughts. And we're going to open out this discussion uh, from the beginning. So if as we're talking about anything, you have a question, please feel free to throw a hand up. And we'd like to sort of not wait until the very end. Um, so I would love to go a little bit into the, the power struggles and to sort of see um, what this tells us about the changing economy of Iran, the corruption that's come with privatization, the rise of the Revolutionary Guard, um, and the role, the increased political and economic role the Revolutionary Guards are playing, and how that works into all of these, all of this infighting that has really gridlocked the system. Um, at stake is billions of dollars in oil revenue, uh, which has flowed into Iran. I think the revenue that's come in in the last eight years has been some astronomical figure that uh, is far more than anything that's coming in the 24 years preceding it. Uh, so there's a great deal of money at stake. There are a lot of economic interests at stake. And a lot of this fighting goes back to that. So um, I, would, I would love to invite you each to sort of give a couple of thoughts on what you think the, the rivalries tell us, what they represent, and um, how much it matters who comes out on top. Shall I start? Yeah. Um, OK. Um, to explain uh, this, uh, what's going on in Iran, if you imagine the political spectrum from left to, uh, to right, at the moment we're talking about very uh, narrow section pretty much to the extreme right. And if you look at this uh, spectrum as an Islamic um, um, political spectrum, we're talking about that very sort of a narrow thing pretty much to the right. Now, um, as Azad as said earlier on, we're going, Iran is going through a major crisis because of the sanctions to begin with, also because of ma mismanagement by Ahmadinejad, um, uh, inflation at 30% or more, um, uh, uh, Iranian real having lost 70% of its value in the last 16 months, 12, 14 months, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, the un unemployment hugely up. Um, one way of looking at this um, election um, period and what is going on in this political spectrum, this narrow political spectrum, is to look at the, the, the idea um, that to begin with, the leader of the country, Ayatollah Khamenei, who has all the leverages of power at his disposal, all the institutions, he's the most powerful man, he's the, uh, the man with the key to these elections. He basically doesn't recognize that Iran is in trouble. He doesn't recognize that Iran is going through this crisis. There is no need for extraordinary measures. Uh, we need to carry on as before. And, and his supporters, of course, follow that line. He wants these elections to pass off, first of all, with, uh, without an incident. Secondly, he wants a high turnout because he wants to reestablish the regime's legitimacy problem <laughs> that it last during, uh, lost during the last election in 2009. So a big turnout would uh, re-establish its legitimacy. And finally, he wants somebody as president who would be subservient to him and his policies. And he will be basically the person who would carry out uh, what he wants done. OK. But there are people who think the country is going through a crisis, a major crisis, as Azad has said, probably the most as, as serious since the end of Iran-Iraq war, which was a pretty vicious and terrible war and devastating war for Iran. So just imagine, you're coming out of a war, that kind of a crisis, no money, everything is destroyed, you have to restart the economy almost from zero. Um, we are back at that kind of a situation now. And yet, the leader doesn't recognize that there is a problem. Of course, there are others who think there is a problem, and we need to, to address this. Amongst those people who do think there is a problem is a very powerful person, uh, is uh, former President Rafsanjani. Former President Rafsanjani, for months, 
has been saying that the country needs a new direction. We have been uh, deviated from the path of the revolution, as he puts it. Uh, he says uh, that we need to uh, form a broad-based government of national unity of some kind so that we can bring uh, as many people as possible in support of this government if we're going to deal with these problems that we are facing today. We cannot do it without it. And he's been trying to get Khomeini to give him the green light because after all, what he says goes. And he basically has been trying to get Khomeini to give him the nod so that he can come and stand in the elections. And he says that if people want him, if, if, if he wants him, he can come in and he can sort things out. For the moment, uh, Khomeini doesn't want him. And, but even today, uh, just before I came, there's a, there's, a, there's a quotation from Rafsanjani saying that those, those people who think they can save the country should come forward. Uh, I think it's a reference to himself to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so th th this is Rafsanjani. And there is a power struggle here, of course. Khomeini doesn't want him. He wants to come. And um, he thinks that if he does come and uh, stand in the elections, he might not win because they might, um, I don't know, do all sorts of things to the results, and then he will be humiliated. Again. There is that problem, yeah. Um, so again, um, and there's also Ahmadinejad. Ahmadinejad is not bothered with the economy, the fact that we are going through crisis, uh, none, of, none of these things. Ahmadinejad yesterday in one of his provincial uh, speeches during his provincial tour said the God will provide for our people. Uh, this, is, this is his idea. Today, if we have it, we're having trouble, people, the prices are going through the roof, people can't afford the basic food and stuff, God will provide, don't worry about it. His, his idea and his uh, supporters are pretty much uh, live in this spiritual world where they um, are awaiting the return of the hidden imam, the 12th imam of the Shiites, Mahdi. And they think once he comes back, uh, we don't need to concern ourselves with, uh, with these uh, lowly um, uh, problems. And, and he's trying to get, because he cannot stand for the uh, third term, he is trying to push his mentor, uh, his name is Mashai, uh, forward as a candidate. Uh, and he, Mashai, is, I've been listening to his speeches, and frankly, I cannot make out what he's getting at. Um, <laughs> and and he's, he's on a different plane. Uh, I'm serious, I'm not joking, and, and it's, 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 it's very strange, actually, that we have a powerful political force today that is, is being pushed with him as a leader that have nothing to do with ordinary problems. I think we can talk briefly about Mashai and the Ahmadinejad camp, because I think if there is a real wild card in this election, it's, it's this question. Will the Ahmadinejad camp be allowed to field the candidate? Will Mashai be permitted on the ballot? Who are these people? And if they're not permitted on the ballot, they will be a thorn in the side of whichever government does come to power. Um, Gonouche describes them as interestingly sort of taking the position of the opposition. They are not wanted anymore in politics. Khomeini wants them out. Uh, they've been called the deviant current. Uh, Mashai does have a very strange kind of atmosphere around him, and there are photos of uh, of Ahmadinejad almost sort of seem bewitched when he stands next to him. There's a kind of, um, there's a sort of murky mentor spiritual kind of glow around all of this that I think makes a lot of, uh, of clerics very suspicious. They don't like that brand of kind of folksy spiritual um, Islam that is seen as very populist, but they're also seen as dangerous to the clerical establishment. They are, um, 
And they're very openly nationalist. Mashai has talked about embracing all nations, about Iran not having um, you know, permanent enmity with Israel. Uh, these, are, these are controversial political players uh, on the scene. Um, they are also very corrupt. The people around them and this circle um, have profited enormously under the last eight years. And, and there are economic interests at play there, too. Um, I think they're viewed by Khamenei, the supreme leader, as having tremendous political prowess. The, he makes these, these men make them nervous. Um, Ahmadinejad had a rally a few days ago at a huge uh, Tehran football stadium, Azadi Stadium, 50,000 people, um, ostensibly to, for a bureaucratic thank you to um, an organization that handled travel and cultural activities during Persian New Year, um, widely seen by the establishment as a sort of campaign foray. Um, and he was attacked very fiercely for that. Men yeah, and women Masha, were mingling. he wasn't there. Yeah. To, um. to everybody's surprise, the, because they are pretending that they are campaigning, although they are extremely weak at the moment. Masha, he wasn't there. And there are signs that um, this cult that they have uh, created, um, the Hojatiye, who believe in the return of the Mahdi, the 12th Imam, um, is actually um, uh, not... Um, uh, as strong as before, because um, uh, very cleverly um, they have embezzled um, great sums of money right through the um, uh, presidency of uh, Ahmadinejad, as we know, by giving small um, uh, subsidiaries uh, to many, many, many um, million uh, poor Iranian uh, families, especially in rural areas. <coughs> but um, and and recently. Ahmadinejad wanted to increase this to uh, threefold. I believe it was 80,000 two months um, in the first period of uh, his presidency, and he wanted to increase this to 250,000 two months, three times as much plus. Um, but this was not um, accepted by the ruling elite. So um, um, as well as the um, clerics shine, the shine of the Mashai and Ahmadinejad camp is also um, uh, very much um, uh, um, dimming. And uh, um, because of the economy being in uh, such a dire straits, um, those few uh, pounds, I mean, 240,000 two months would be in old money. The, the exchange rate is, uh, to the dollar is now ninefold what it was before. The, uh, the exchange rate to the dollar and, and the um, price of gold. So you can imagine that you know people are really suffering at the, the poor people especially the, the middle classes are now becoming um, the target you know they, they can't afford things so um, whilst I um, completely agree uh, with the insightful analysis that Casra projects, I want to also say that we have to look at the mechanisms that might come forward because of, of, of uh, the shine has worn off. Uh, the idea of the cult um, may not be as strong as we, we might perceive it any longer. Um, the economic situation at, the, at all levels, but particularly for the very poor, is devastating. So people um, uh, simply have to come to the streets rather, rather than the ballot. And this is, this, is, this is worrying, I think, for the ruling elite. I think, the, I think there might just be a chance that um, the ruling elite will be considering these issues uh, more astutely. They, yes, uh, I, I believe that um, the supreme leader is very laid back. I think when the um, billions of dollars were embezzled um, in Iran, he came on television and said, take it easy. He simply said, forget it. You know, don't be, don't be so, um, <laughs> so worried about it. It is a you know, he, he used a very particular uh, term uh, as if he was saying quiet children, you know. But I, 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 I want to always leave for us a, a ray of hope that um, we have these um, possibilities amongst the masses. And also, although um, it is frightening, I came back from Iran uh, in January, um, the um, Sepah and the Basij, the uh, Revolutionary Guards and the paramilitary, are so strong. They are on every major street in Iran. They have headquarters. Yet, one meets their children. And these children who have 
gone through education and um, are, are media savvy are beginning to form um, different opinions to the ways that they brought. There have been um, defections from the um, um, Revolutionary Guard sector. So um, there are just little signs, and as I said, you know, with the, with the promise of demonstrations and strikes by a number of unions, um, and uh, the number of people who have been imprisoned, over 10,000 young people since 19, uh, 2009. So maybe we can um, 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 build a counter picture I don't know how you feel about that. Well, I think that's I think that's an important point is that conservative Iran and we're talking about a margin and we can it will be arguable. People will have different measures of what that margin is, but it's not monolithic. There's a younger generation who has access to global culture who's not as conservative and ideological and traditional as their parents. Many of these young people were active um, on the streets in the Green movement and yes. And, and suffered um, as well as the sort of upper middle class, middle class, secular um, sort of poster children of, of that green movement as well. So um, conservative Iran is not monolithic. There is um, a sort of diversity of, of cultural attitudes towards government and towards this whole political yes. process. I think that's important. Um, Ahmadinejad's star and the cult star is dimming and inflation is helping that because those subsidies yes. up against 40% inflation can only help so much. Um, and I'm, and I'm interested in talking about participation. I think I'm going to turn that over to you because I think this is going to be crucial. Khamenei, the regime needs participation for this election. Um, and to do that, it's traditionally sort of eased up and allowed for lively debate, but that will be dangerous this time. So, exactly. If I saw Khamenei wanted a really interesting you know, election with participation, he would let Mashai run, he would let Khatami run, and um, among the conservatives, maybe Qaribov would emerge. Then, you know, the thinking is that the Mashai and Khatami people would break up the vote and, you know, their guy would um, emerge victorious. But as Castro said earlier, I think the issue, I mean, it's too risky for them. Raf Sanjani reportedly in 1997 talked Khamenei into letting the election go as it was going, and that's how Khatami became president. Um, became president, wildly popular, you know, but it took them all that time to regain control of what was able, what, what happened in the little period of time that, you know, Khatami brought about some reforms and changes. And, you know, I, I think, so basically, I don't, I don't think that will happen, but um, one of the things that they're doing um, now is for the first time they have put the council, the local council elections with the presidential election. So this way, people in the provinces and the villages do turn out for these votes, for these elections, because they're important and their votes count in terms of who they know becoming you know, uh, appointed. So there's going to be participation um, in that realm. And of course, again, because you, know, you get your passport stamped and it gives you access to things. You, know, you, you do that even if you turn in a blank vote. So that's possible. And of course, there's also the possibility that they you know, help bus everyone to. You know, so so that, that is going to happen. But it, right now, it really just depends on who they allow um, to run. But um, I, I don't think they'll, I mean, my, my gut feeling is they wouldn't want to do that because it's too risky, because they remember what happened four years ago. And I think often they play by the 1979 playbook. Um, they saw the Shah when he felt he was in trouble, began to open up, and that's how they took over and how the revolution was won. And so during the past four years, every time you think that, my God, you know, you, you have to give in, you have to make some compromise, so you have to allow some opening, they haven't done that. They've made it tighter, they made it tighter, and I think they're afraid that by doing anything that the Shah did, um, they're all, they were all around back then that would be their demise too. I think that's really astute, and I think we see that in domestic and foreign policy, this idea that showing any sign of compromise um, projects an image of weakness, and it invites more pressure, which sort of puts the regime in a bind, because it can't soften um, in any way, because it fears that that will just invite more. Um, I think we have a question here. Uh, Tom Fenton, so, some of the things that you, all of you have mentioned, some of the things that all of you have mentioned, uh, 
remind me of things I saw in 1978 when I was there. The disenchantment of the young people, the horrible economy, the inflation, uh, the uh, obsidation the, uh, of, the, uh, of the government, the, the, u the strikes, the union activity. You know, where are we on a scale now? I, uh, it just, it feels a bit like the, then. Mm -hmm. The indicators are there. So where where do you all see the pressure point? Are we in, in pre-revolutionary, counter-revolutionary uh, situation? Your diagnosis. <laughs> do, you, do you want me to go first? <laughs> I, you know, I think what's been famously said over the past four years is that Iranians are revolutioned out. They know that, you know, as bad as they think things are, when the next person comes, it's going to get worse. And there's always someone worse, even if your imagination can't go there right now. And so that's, and, and a lot of them feel like they are, they, they think, why should we risk our lives for you? Because and I, and by you, they mean people who are probably you know, in, in Los Angeles or people who can't afford to leave when things are bad and then come back. And there are people probably in Los Angeles who still think they can, the villas are still there and they can go back. And I, and I think there's, um, even these, this young, gener you know, the young generation that doesn't remember the revolution, um, these are their parents, these are their uncles, these are their relatives, and um, I think it's much, so it's very complex. And I think one of the, again, one of the smart things that um, the government, the Islamic Republic did after they, you know, they came to power was to have like an extra layer, they saw how the military defected in favor of the revolution, and that's really when things came down. So they created a second layer of, you know, and the SIPA came because of that. and. During the Shah's time, it was a very um, it was a narrower coalition of the government um, that was at, uh, the Shah's entourage that was raping and pillaging the country. Now it's much more extensive, and it cut, cuts across you know classes and everything. So there's more people who are benefiting. People you wouldn't imagine would want this you know country to you know the regime to go on the way it is. Actually, are uh, supporters of it. So I think um, they've done that pretty cleverly, and um, you know, the past four years they've made it relatively easy for anyone who's a dissident to get the hell out because you become irrelevant as soon as you leave the country. So, you know, who knows? I mean, and of course, you know, it's always like afterwards you can look back and say, oh yes, of course this happened because we saw this and that. But at this point, I don't see it. Even though there's a lot of people who say, yeah, just eight more months, don't worry. You know? Do I if you disagree with that? Do you see the no, pressure it's, um, more intense? I think that uh, the, the fact that there is discontent on a, on a massive scale, uh, I don't think anybody disputes that, um, except perhaps uh, Ayatollah Khomeini and people uh, who, who don't think there is a crisis. Um, beyond that, uh, there is also the issue of, of uh, the regime being somewhat clever in blaming all the problems that people are facing today on a daily basis to foreigners, to the sanctions, to the Americans, to all that. Uh, like, you know, everything you mentioned these days, oh, we couldn't buy this because it's sanctioned, we couldn't do that because, the, like today they were saying that the, the speed of the internet is, is low because we couldn't uh, get the latest equipment. But the speed of the internet has been low for the last 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and nobody did anything about it even before these sanctions. So it's all sort of, you know. And then, on, on, again, going further, uh, at the time of the Iranian Revolution, there was an altern political alternative. Uh, Khomeini uh, provided that. Today, there is no political um, alternative, A, and B, many people having gone through one revolution and have seen what it might bring, there is, um, I think I'm, I'm safe to say that there is little appetite for another revolution without them knowing where they're going next. I think this can, well, if you want to add to that, but I thought maybe you could talk to us a little bit about the opposition and where they are in this. Because if we agree that, by and large, there's no appetite for major upheaval, no one wants another revolution, um, where does the opposition stand? The reformists, do they still seek to mobilize people onto the streets? They are disorganized, they don't have vision. Are they going to factor into any of this? 
Um, the reasons uh, the opposition as such in, in Iran, um, for a number of reasons, uh, in that even Khatami, as I mentioned, he's been invited to um, accept uh, uh, candidacy. He, you know, he hasn't said anything. Um, uh, is not exactly opposition to, to the Vlad Fari, to the supreme leader, uh, because he is a cleric of Khatami. Um, and uh, this is the point of discontentment with his eight years in office, that he, he was there and what he had promised, the rule of the people did not um, come about. Um, nevertheless, the, the sites that one um, uh, looks at um, discuss the fact that every Iranian um, uh, at the age of voting should come and vote. And this is very important because I know that a lot of people, millions, are saying uh, they don't want to vote ever again because um, it is uh, just putting salt on their wounds. They, they, they use this language. It is deeply um, hurtful and um, they resent it. Um, but I want to also um, uh, mention something about the face of Iran is not what it was in 1978. Um, Iran in 1978, it, the Iranian nation was not um, as educated and as watchful and as um, able in terms of socio-political terms um, as, as Iran today is. The, um, um, the education system has created um, an Iranian cosmopolitanism that is unprecedented in that um, um, inadvertently not by the government's design, but after the Iran-Iraq war, um, in the period of reconstruction, the opening of a number of educational routes for the very, very poor and very rural to access education through military service, come to, to do their military service, and then um, have a year as a, as a teacher in the rural areas, and then go to the first year of university without taking the um, entrance examination. And for young mothers, I know several of them who are now in their mid-30s, who were from traditional families, had children at 15, married at 14, had children at 15. They are, they've now found, found um, colleges of further education has a different name in Iran. And so we've ended up in Iran with an educated nation, you know, but they, they speak their own, uh, uh, um, not the government, but the educational system, talk about 90% of Iranians being uh, literate, um, by, by, by which I mean they have uh, accessed post-compulsory education. So either they have finished uh, their high school diploma and have taken a, a course for a year or two, or actually gone to university. Maybe some of them haven't finished, but many have finished. So, the face of Iran today is completely different to the face of 1978. For, for this reason, and, and considering the toxic regime that, that, that is operating now, um, and considering the fact that mothers are telling, mothers and fathers, parents are telling their children, no, we will give you everything we have, don't go and demonstrate. Consider all these facts. I think it is just possible that um, you know, things happen. I mean, uh, Alibaf, you, you mentioned, he is the mayor of Tehran, and he's very close to the supreme leader. But he's been working very hard um, to um, have programs of um, um, infrastructure and restructural um, plans for, for Tehran, for the capital, in terms of roads. And, uh, you know, this, is, this has been noticed by the young people. And although he is faithful, um, certain people call him this, a servant to, to, to the supreme leader, um, he might just show, has, he, he, it's possible that he's been showing us one of his faces. He may have al alternative solutions, you know, because obviously he, these people are intelligent. Yeah, Khalibaf is an interesting figure. I remember in um, 2005, he had these uh, Top Gun aviator sunglasses, and he was a pilot, I think, when he was in the Revolutionary Guards. Um, 
And he ran a very kind of youth savvy campaign and he was criticized for it, but it was very popular. Yes. Uh, pop music from his campaign headquarters and um, slightly kind of risque campaign posters. And there was a lot of traction around that, yes. although it kind of, it did alienate a slightly more traditional passage attending, participating yes. kind of constituency as well. But that's the kind of candidate that mm -hmm. I think um, could could put the regime onto sort of uncertain footing. Someone like Qalibov could be very popular. Mm -hmm. Tehran is a more beautiful and more well-managed city than it's ever been before. Um, people have noticed that. Um, and so this, you know. With the youth in mind, because there are certain bridges and, and congregation places mm -hmm. where there is space um, for, for, for the youth to get away from the gaze of the regime. And if there is the gaze of regime present, it has different forms. So, um, I don't want to imagine those who are the servants of the Velayat al Fari or the Supreme Leader to be mind necessarily all of them mindless people. Or, or, you know, so I want to um, give credit to the intelligence that also, um, the, the cultural capital that exists, that, uh, you know, a lot of people are recognizing, although they were not um, um, happy with Khatami. Um, they see him as a as a as a as the country's capital as a resource. So it is possible that if he doesn't get the candidacy, he might support some people or the the candidate who you know. So it, we cannot completely take away the play of elections in any global situation away from Iran. Iran is also. Um, in that uh, you know, political turmoil that we find many other countries are at the time of elections. There's a question at the back. Do you want to wait for the mic? Just Sorry, so we can hear you better. Thank you. Hi. Um, I think the question that you've been analyzing so far has been revolving around who will enter the elections. But I think a, a question that a lot of, especially young people, um, and there's many of them that obviously have the experience of um, four years ago very alive in their head. Their question is, will they vote? And secondly, if they vote, if the vo votes are going to be counted. And I think that is um, essentially something that a lot of people are trying to figure out. Um, what's your take on that? Um, yeah, I think that's a great question. I think that's really important. Yeah. You know, um, will that legacy be erased? The um, the, op the real opposition camp, you know, the Karubis and the Musavis, they've remained silent until now. And well, they've, have, they're, they've been silent so far about whether they want to, there's been no bo boycott called yet. And they've been silent so far, kind of implying that they don't think that people should vote, that the issues of four years ago have not been resolved yet. So. I don't, I mean, my guess would be they don't want Khatami to run either because, again, it helps legitimize the regime and everything. So the whole system. Um, so that's, that, that's a question. Um, a few, uh, recently they put two websites, one called um, you know, Khatami Supporters, saying um, salamkhatami.com and salamkhatami.org. One lasted for four days or one lasted for um, eight days or 14 days. Um, and they were discussing about you know, whether he should run, whether he shouldn't run. And I think it's probably divided in how people feel about whether it makes any sense for someone like that to do that. And of course, they, the government still seems to be intimidated by it because they shut it down. And you know, But I think that's kind of the big issue. No one really knows. No one really knows. But so far, I think everyone is just a lot of the diehards don't believe that you know, this is, why do a repeat of um, four years ago? But when I did talk to a young person, they said, look, even if Khatami is allowed to run, they'll make sure that his name doesn't come out of the ballot box. But I think that disenchantment, that, that sort of suspicion of the ballot box, which, which has come out of the last, especially the last election, is going to be is going to be significant. And will people even trust the, the turnout figures? Um, you know, can they be trusted after the, the tampering and the sort of widespread doubt of the credibility of the last election? Um, I think these are all going to be really key to the question of participation. Was well, there a question over here? This side. There's a mic coming around. 
Thank you, Yossi Mekelberg. Uh, two questions. One is to look at the international factors. How do you see the Arab Spring, the influence of the Arab Spring or what happens in this election, and also the nuclear issue? Do you think it's debated? It's something which will feed into the elections? The other thing, in case of the election, seems as rigged as the case in 2009. Can you see another? Because originally, what happened in Iran was kind of the original Twitter revolution. And it was called like that. Can you see it happening again? And then what will be the reaction of the regime in case if it happens? Um, nuclear issue, is it going to... Is it going to nuclear suffering? issue for Iran... Um, um, I was involved in a debate not long ago. Um, we didn't get anywhere with it. Um, in Iran, it is um, it is seen as an issue, but it is the the sanctions that is really symbolizing that. Um, um, I have interviewed a lot of young people in Iran who um, asked the question: Why does the West? want Iran not to develop civil nuclear power? This is a, a serious question a lot of people ask. And simply, um, they, 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 they think, um, they, they, they believe they deserve technology. You know, Iran, um, 7,000 years ago, was firing pots of four meter diameter. That was the technology then, 7,000 years ago. So you can't. You know, these things don't just die. Continuity is everywhere. So a lot of young people, I'm not saying everybody, um, uh, see their place in the world with civil um, development of nuclear power, not, not a bomb. No, Can I nobody. ask you, even despite sanctions, do you think that is, despite 40% inflation and 27%, do they, are they willing to pay the price for that? Because I don't dispute you. I think that no. people feel like they should have it. But do you think that given the economic suffering that everyone is feeling in their daily it's, life. It's very, they still very, want it. it's very difficult to gauge, but um, I was told uh, by a 30-year-old um, um, writer, but he, he's a professional writer, you know, in a, in a periodical, so he makes money at, so he's not sitting around at home. He goes to work every morning. He said, he said we, we, okay. we had the war. Uh, he said, I, I, I didn't participate in it, but I saw people around me who participated in it. Um, we went and demonstrated, and he was imprisoned. Uh, for, uh, he was one of the people who was uh, forgiven not long ago for, the, um, um, uh, for Ramadan. So he, you know, was, he, he said that we, we experienced imprisonment, and we will experience hunger. I, I, I thought that was... That was very poignant. I mean, for, for a healthy 30-year-old who wants to go out and does go out and writes and uh, is very, very acute, you know, he listens to the news, he's, um, he sees the bullying of the West on um, many fronts. He said, so we will, we will learn to be hungry. We will go hungry. That's one response. And in taxis, um, people don't say, uh, uh, they, they say sanctions, and they say, "What does uh, William Hague want from us?" That's, I was I was asked that. So um, people will um, suffer more. They have been suffering, but a lot of people know that there is it's because as the result of sanctions. But it's not the the message that has got home yet. So mm -hmm. there is a lot of. Uh, I think there might be. Um, I think this question of who is blamed for sanctions is very important. And I think, it's, I think there's a class divide in terms of who blames the West and who blames the government's policies. But do you have a take on that? that Everyone I've spoken to, who um, any Westerner that's recently been in Iran, was surprised by how nobody was targeting them as a reason behind the sanctions. They thought that they would be singled out as like, it's because of you, but it wasn't like that at all. My impression actually is that people are not willing to pay the price that they have to, to have a nuclear program, um, whether it's civilian or not. And I think what it, there's usually a four-year lag between what the world outside of Iran understands of what's actually going in, on in Iran. Um, you know, maybe before 2009, people really believed in that. They felt that um, you know, things were moving in the right direction. And, uh, but from, since 2009, I, can't, I have not come across anyone who um, holds that point of view that they're willing to suffer for 
leaders they don't believe in, for um, a system they don't believe in, um, all because. And, and I think Iranians um, tend to be, you know, I, I think e even if diplomats, even if Obama came out and said that, um, you know, no, Iran's program really is for civilian purposes because Khamenei issued a fatwa against it, Iranians would say, oh, yeah, right. I mean, come on. Probably. So uh, I don't think, um, my impression is that Iranians are not that simplistic. Um, and I don't think they're willing to pay the price. And um, I, a re another reporter who went in recently and spoke to someone at the bazaar um, who said that, you know, okay, wonderful nuclear program for electricity and this and that, but there's much more important things. And yeah. this reporter said, look, um, my impression is, I mean, last time I was here, um, four years ago, people said that they do want the nuclear program. They're willing to make sacrifices. And he goes, who are you talking to? You must have been talking to people, the 20% that are tied somehow to this economy, um, tied to um, the Revolutionary Guards who are benefiting, and of course they're going to say that. But I think overwhelmingly um, they're not willing to. And um, if I may I, just, uh, uh, yes, just yes, because there's a question in the certainly, back, and I certainly. want to let Kasra address yes. the second part of that question about the Arab Spring, and um, which was preceded by the Tehran summer, um, and whether that is going to have um, any kind of implications for, for Iran or how that. I really can't the see. Landscape. I can't see uh, uh, that it will have an impact. Uh, not now. Um, a few months ago, a year ago, a year and a half ago, when it started. Uh, the, uh, the hopes were high in Iran that, you know, it might reach Tehran and other cities, um, but it didn't, and it's died down, and I'm not sure what they make out of what is going on in Syria today, and if that is a positive thing, whether they want to um, it, see that kind of a Arab Spring spread to Tehran. I'm not sure at all. So I don't think it's relevant uh, that much. Uh, on the nuclear issue, I think it's, the, the country is clearly divided. Um, six months ago, there was a demonstration in Tehran after a huge fall in the value of Riyadh. One of the things people shouted in the streets was that we don't want nuclear um, uh, energy. That is, that is indicative. I think the, a lot of people, at least those people who went uh, out to demonstrate, um, who were shouting this slogan, obviously they saw what was happening to them and the nose drive and nose fall of, of the value of real as a consequence of that, and they said they didn't want it. And I remember during 2009 um, um, demonstrations too, there were instances where people held up placards that we want peaceful nuclear thing. Um, so there is that too. Obviously, there are people who think Iran should go all the way, and these people are pretty much uh, either very nationalistic <laughs> or very much in support of the present um, government and people in power. It's become a nationalistic issue too. Uh, the Iranian leaders occasionally compare this to the nationalization of oil in 1952 by Mossadegh then, uh, which was a pretty big thing in the history of Iran. Uh, a nationalistic movement to nationalize the oil and wrest it from the British. Um, so that comparison is there. And I've come across very um, intelligent, educated people who argue for Iran, that Iran should carry on along this path and hold on to its nuclear program and nuclear uh, policies. Because of that, they think, this is, this is the right of the Iranians to do so. In terms of the elections, none of these candidates are going to make any difference to the policies of um, Iran in six months' time after the elections vis-a-vis -vis the nuclear issue. All of them are looking up to Khamenei to lay the line. Um, and 
even Raf Sanjani is, is, he knows that this is the, the key to the problems, that it has to be resolved. But even he, I don't think, once, even if he's in power, can do much about it without the support of Khomeini. Having said all this, the next president is the person who has to deal with this issue because the time is running out. All these people abroad, uh, from the Americans, from the EU, EU <coughs> Israelis, everyone is setting a deadline of six months or eight months for Iran to deal with this or else. I think the next president has to decide really and will, will be seen in history as the one who, who's on, on whose watch this was either uh, resolved or led to a war. Um, there were a couple of questions at the back. Wait, wait, over here, sorry, in the middle. <laughs> Just picking up on your points about the nuclear question, I was just wondering what separate panelists um, think of the view that America might not be being entirely genuine uh, about why they are chasing non-proliferation in Iran. Perhaps they've got other motivations like regime change and non-proliferation is just a, a sap because it's easy to sell because Iran is a bunch of Armageddonists, nutters, they can cast them in the media who uh, will be irrational if they have a, uh, have a nuclear weapon. Um, an associated part is also using Iranian human rights as a reason. Um, for example, when Nixon opened up to China, the internal politics of China and the internal human rights repression wasn't so much as an, uh, as an issue as they're saying it is with Iran. And I was just wondering, generally, do you think Americans' intentions um, in using the uh, non-proliferation stick are genuine? Do you think that they actually care? Um, I was um, at the White House not that long ago, and we had, it was a group of Iranian Americans, and we were allowed to ask administration officials questions. And I had heard repeatedly from, Iran, uh, from American diplomats that um, regime change was not US policy, it was not Obama's policy. So, and I knew there was a lot of um, people there who thought that even you know, among the Iranians that, are, that live in Washington that think that that's the policy. I said, um, look, everyone, most Iranians I know are under the impression that your policy is regime change and you guys are doing a very lousy job of it because, and you know, the guy was very, no, this is not our policy. And uh, I, I genuinely believe that they don't, they, they think that they're going to um, be able to work something um, out you know, short of um, going to war. But, and, and, I, and I think the human rights issue might, is a good stick to have to, you know, if they put enough pressure on the human rights issue, then they w might give concessions, um, you know, otherwise. But, so anyways, in short, I think it's not regime change at this point. Do either you feel very strongly about adding to that, or shall we go to? Um, I side with the, um, a lot of Iranians and non-Iranians that um, the intentions of America, um, knowingly and unknowingly, are not trustworthy. Um, I, I don't, because um, we don't see um, equality of countries and nations before international law. Um, so, um, uh, human rights uh, um, um, are, are these are pointers. I don't I don't trust the the uh, the Americans. I'm I'm slightly sort of I have a different view on. That. I think that is somewhat genuine. This concern the West has given the track record of Iran in the last 30 years, um, in terms of support for all sorts of dodgy people around the world, hostage taking, not playing the international rules, and, uh, and having a government in Tehran who doesn't play ball, and is, is shown by its track record that cannot be trusted with a weapon of this um, magnitude, and I think if I were 
anybody outside Iran. And I heard that people like Mashai, for example, had their um, finger on the nuclear trigger. I would be very concerned, actually. Um, having said all this, there is international law, and I would have thought you would expect Iran and others to stick to that. Um, there are six UN resolutions demanding Iran to stop its sensitive nuclear enrichment activities. There are several IAEA uh, resolutions yes. demanding Iran to stop that. So if you're talking about legality in terms of international law, this is international law. They are at the outside of that law. They have to realize that. And if they want to carry on, the simple thing, like others who have done before Iran, is to win the support of the IAEA, the trust of the IAEA, and then move on. And that, to begin with, they have to allow IAEA inspectors in, open up everything, agree to additional protocol that allows um, a close inspection, and, and take it from there. If they really want and serious about um, developing a peaceful nuclear program uh, for their energy needs, why the secrecy? Let, let the IAEA in, let them see everything, and subscribe to that regime and move on. Yes, I, I understand that the issue is enriched degree of enrichment. It is, uh, it is, uh, it is not um, uh, yet. I'm, I'm against nuclear power <laughs> myself personally, but I don't. Um, I, I find the intentions of the um, uh, of the U.S. Are untrustworthy. Yet, I, I from Casmi, a very good site you might want to consult, which has all the documentations. Um, uh, Kazmi.com uh, campaign against sanctions and military intervention in Iran um, provides all the documents. I understand that it is the degree of enrichment that Iran is engaging with at the moment, which is nowhere near the high degree that is would be used for. This is what I have understood. Anyway. Um, we can move on from this because we don't want to. Yes, the nuclear issue gets very murky once we start talking about 20% and, and. That's right, 9% and 20%. Um, it's murky, but it's political as well. And I think you've all made important contributions to this because I think that the NPT gives nations that are signatory certain rights, but then nations that chant death to Israel and call for destructions of countries that are aligned with the world's at present great superpower then come under greater scrutiny. And that is just reality. Um, over here, you've been waiting for a while. We'll come back over there. Right here. Um, um, two questions. My first question might be bringing it back a little bit. Um, but you had mentioned like that there's not really hope for revolution. People are revolutioned out. The candidates. You know, Ali sounds nice, but there's not really too ho much hope in the candidates. But yet there's this huge sense of disenchantment. So I'm wondering, is there another option? Because it kind of sounds like then nothing is going to happen. You know, like people are just going to continue living with this. And what, what are they going to wait till the supreme leader dies or, or something like that, till the elders die? You know, where, where is the ray of hope? And my second question is for... I know you had mentioned that there's this sense of they're not too happy with the current president. I never can say his name, his last name. I find it very hard to say. But um, with the type of mysticism and and, and kind of uh, religious fanaticism that he's built, people have grown a little weary about that. They're not they're burst in the spiritual bubble. So I'm wondering if in general there's a not only a disen, uh, disenchantment with politics, but also with how close politics has been intertwined with religion in Iran? Uh, the heart of the matter. <laughs> um, disenchantment with, uh, with religious government. Do we see that? And ray of hope. 
quick takes, very quick, so we can get to the back. Um, I don't think anyone really believes this, especially after 2009, that anyone that anyone's really religious in that government. And I, I personally believe, I, I don't necessarily believe that Mashe and Ahmadinejad necessarily believe in their own, you know, rhetoric. I, I think that it's a way, I mean, it's been widely interpreted as their way of getting rid of the clerics. And one of the reasons why people have hope in someone like Mashe is because they think that if he becomes president, this will be the end of the regime, or at the very least, if you know, it'll mean that they'll push the religious what remains of you know the religious influence um, in Iran will be gone. Um, and then again, some people believe if there's a military dictatorship, um, the possibility of that kind of changing the system is more likely than if the current system with the sepa with you know the religious leaders remain. So, um, you know, so I think that's their ray of hope at the moment. Ray of hope, um, <laughs> difficult to say. <laughs> difficult to say, I'm afraid. Um, um, I'm hoping that these elections will throw up a new arrangement that out of that, we will have to see where the hope lies and, and how to proceed. But um, going back earlier on to, the, to a question earlier on, there's a, there's, a, there's a problem in these elections, a major problem, and that is that the two leaders of the reform movement are today in prison, uh, in house, under house arrest. And, and how can you have elections when you have two of your um, earlier leaders one of them is the Prime Minister of Iran during the Iran-Iraq war. Not an um, easy job he, he had at that time. And then the other is a very senior cleric, twice Speaker of Parliament. Uh, these two are under house arrest without any trial, without any, any uh, charges. And yet they are holding <coughs> elections uh, and expecting everyone to come and register and vote and be jolly and happy. I don't think uh, the reform movement is going to be happy to go to, uh, to vote while the leaders are still under house arrest. Um, that is a problem. They have to solve this. It's 51 days before the elections and um, I suppose if they do move and release these people, there will be a chance of reformists coming in. And then, out of all this, you might have a new arrangement, and maybe we will see something that we can pin our hopes on. The discussions in, um, in, in, in public transport and buses and tax, little taxis that carry different you know, groups, not just one person, and in chemists, because uh, apart from um, food um, and commodities being very expensive, medicine is becoming scarce. So the discussion is we don't believe their religion, even from very religious people. So um, the, the shine of this religious thing has, uh, the fervor um, has, has gone away to a, to a large degree. And I think it's the, um, um, the, the, we have to watch this economic thing with, to, whether, to see whether it is the streets or the ballot. It's quite serious. We all agree that the Islamic legitimacy of the regime has collapsed. We found a point of mutual agreement. Um, over here. Hi, I just wanted to find out what uh, your attitude was on Western sentiment on the streets in Iran. Um, what, what impact are the sanctions having on general perception of Western, um, Western attitudes? And if there is any clamor at all from inside Iran for Western support in the change for regime, I know you said that the US is, it, it, the, their top line at the moment is that they're not, that isn't part of their policy, but was, were the West to intervene politically, would there be support for that on, on the ground? Support for foreign intervention? Um, go, go. No, no. Um, 
I don't think there is a question of a foreign intervention as such that would help anybody in Iran. Um, the only thing that comes to my mind is that if, for example, there's going to be a war and there, there are going to be attacks on Iran's nuclear facilities that um, people are talking about in Israel and elsewhere, um, then the question is what would happen? Would Iranians rally behind uh, their government or rise up <coughs> against it? Uh, my own reading is, is the former in a sense that once there is a foreign um, intervention of various kind tends to rally people and get people together behind their, their, their government, whatever the color that government uh, has. Um, that's my, my, my reading. I can't really sort of um, be more specific about that, why I think that. But that's, that's the feeling, knowing the history of the country. I suspect you both largely agree with that. Not yes. That Iranians would not rise up and revolt. Is you know, there um, a nuance you want to add to that? Um, I think the nuance is you don't need a majority of people to rally behind the government if there were an attack. You need just a percentage that is solidly behind the government. And that would be enough to kind of pull the thing through. So it's very risky. and. It's been pe people. I, I've said. I've heard this said that um, you know, if there were an attack on Iran, it would look a lot like Syria, if not worse, because Iran is not just Persians. There's uh, there's parts of it that are close to Pakistan, close to Afghanistan. There's Arabs in the south. There's the Persians are only about 50, 51 percent. So it is a very diverse um, society and. A lot has happened over the past 30 years that may make some of them actually consider you know, wanting to be a part of something else. So it's very dangerous. Right. So there isn't as, as such any support or like cry internally for Western intervention. The Iranian people are very much dealing with this on their own terms. Um, you know, you hear um, you hear people say that I wish they would come and, but you know. I don't know how representative of that is. I mean, it's of course only some people, but it's the same thing they've been saying for 30 years, that this is the only way that things are going to change. But for the most part, I mean, and, and, I've, and of course being, I, I spoke to someone recently who left Iran and he was surprised by how anti-sanctions the Iranians and the Westerners were more so than the people that are actually in Iran. And I said, why don't you write about that? He goes, no, it's so politically vile that um, it would take your publication down. It, I, I can't even say it. I, I mean, I even hold my tongue. Because, but, and of course, things can, can always change. In the span of a month, when things get worse, even the people. And I think that's one of the things to remember um, about Iran. Just because somebody holds a certain position right now doesn't mean a week later he will be standing behind that position. Things will change. And of course, circumstances are always changing. And I think the ultimate ray of hope for people is that so far, anything that has happened has been unpredictable. Nobody really predicted what was going to happen in 2009. So if something happens, it's not because we sat here and predicted it was going to happen. Name of Sam Fredericks. I think we can take one more. There are three. Really. Maybe if we're very quick, we can do one more. Okay, one round. One round, okay. It's a very quick answer. Though. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you haven't yet mentioned one facet of the opposition. One facet of the opposition. <laughs> I think. One facet of the opposition is the MAK. And I just wondered how how they relate to the green movement, and they they seriously believe that um, intervention in Iran is not to be um, supported. That on, the only change will come through the resistance, which they believe they are the main ones, and and um, <laughs> so. I don't know, you haven't mentioned this at all, and I was just wondering. Um, 
Um, yeah, we haven't mentioned them because I think you'll see by all of our expressions right now <laughs> um, that they're sort of roundly discounted. And I'm going to turn this over, but register um, our looks of, of contempt and horror at the even mention um, of this group. But I'll let our panelists explain why um, we're not talking you about know, um, them. I, I think um, this might sum it up. If you go to the person that hates this regime more than anyone, hates Ayatollah Khamenei, hates everything the Islamic Republic stands for, doesn't see a ray of hope, say, do you prefer Ayatollah Khamenei or the MEK? They will say Ayatollah Khamenei. That's the day that Ayatollah Khamenei will actually like, win in a ballot box. If there was... They're not in the picture. Because they've assassinated Iranian officials, there are many reasons. I wonder, does the regime Bashir al-Assad, do? is there any discussion whatsoever, any discussion of any disagreement in the regime at the different levels of the regime? Because, of course, there are several regimes in Iran, aren't there? There's Differences of opinion on how to deal with Assad and Syria. Mild support on television, very mild. Very mild, very general terms, no discussion. Uh, support for uh, his system, but not really discussing it or analyzing it analyzing it on the uh, news channel. It's very controlled, very mild, um, um, just uh, a few sentences about he's the leader, we recognize him, it's the, uh, uh, the Western, um, you know, so. Because it's cost a fortune to Iran to back him up. Oh, yeah. He's Iranians expensive. don't. He's an expensive don't habit. <laughs> The, the one thing Iranians dislike, well, not another thing Iranians dislike <laughs> about this regime intensely is the support of Syrian government and, unfortunately, the support for Palestinians. Um, yeah, you um, add to that? Just very quickly, I think um, the, the, at one point, some six months ago, when Bashar Assad wasn't doing too well in Tehran, in, 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 in Damascus, um, Ahmadinejad was showing some signs of, of, of wanting to change tack and lessen the support that Iran was providing uh, to uh, his regime. Uh, but then again, he started to do better, and then that dropped off. And today, even though things are looking pretty horrific, um, the support within the regime for Assad regime in Iran is pretty solid. I haven't seen any sign of dissent in recent months. Um, I'm the only one whose book is on display now. Uh, <laughs> a quick plug. Um, I, I think it's important that well, all, while all this is going on, we try to understand other nations and through the life experience of those citizens form new understandings. You know, I think this is really, really important. So um, my book is an opportunity to understand something about the new generation. Yes, yes, well, thank you very Well, I mean, much. it would be silly to just... No, 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 no. Not say anything. No, no, you're sitting next to it, of yeah. course. It must be said. Um, well, I think we're going to stop there. Thank you very much to this wonderful panel and for all of you for having, uh, helping us have a lively discussion. Um, and I think we'll all wait and watch and see what happens. And maybe we'll gather here in a few months and, and see uh, what has come to pass. Thank you very much. Thank you.